And without any further ado, Michael Knight. Thanks. I think somebody needs to make a podium with like a, like a little cup holder. Thank you. Uh, so many thank yous. Thank you to the amazing staff. Thank you to Gwen and to Megan. And of course, thank you to Wyatt Prunny, who's sneaking in in the back. Wyatt, um, I have a, a, a much more to say on the subject of my gratitude to you, but if it's all right, can we put a pin in it for a second and let me do it before my reading next week? Let me do it in a couple of days. <laughs> and just leave, just leave it in there. Um, thank you. Uh, last year was my first year at the Swanee Conference, and uh, I was, of course, thrilled and flattered and honored and excited and nervous and anxious. Um, I was aware of the privilege of such an invitation, um, and I can't remember exactly who it was then, Megan or Wyatt, probably Megan, but Someone reached out to me at the time about the possibility of doing a craft talk last summer. And I thought about it for about, I don't know, nine seconds <laughs> and said, <clears throat> no, no, thank you. Um, I think, you know, this is my first go around. I'd rather just sort of listen and learn this time. But I did start thinking like, well, what if you had to do it? Like, what if um, they had said, we'd like to invite you to this conference, but you must give a craft talk in order to attend? What would you talk about? And you know, I thought about a lot of different things, but the subject that I kept coming back around to was imagery. Um, I mean, everybody in this room already knows that imagery is our most fundamental tool for creating mood and atmosphere, for defining our characters, for reflecting their interior lives, for doing a whole host of the things that we do on the page, and ultimately, Imagery is our most fundamental tool for generating meaning. And I spend a lot of time in my classes at the University of Tennessee talking about imagery, uh, so much time uh, that I thought, well, you know, I have a lot to say on this subject and maybe even a thing or two to say on this subject that you haven't already heard uh, somebody else say before. And I even started thinking, well, maybe there's an essay in this. Like, you know, not only can I give this talk to you guys eventually, but I can write this essay I'll publish it in some fancy pants journal, and that'll be good. And I went so far as to come up with a catchy title for this essay. And the title was going to be um, Beyond Description. <laughs> see what I did there? You see, see, it was both clever in its repurposing of the cliche, and also, I thought, like quite suggestive of the many brilliant things that I would indeed have to tell you about imagery. However, <clears throat> uh, I sat down and started to write the thing. And you know, all this time I was like, literally all this time I would, I don't know if you guys do this, but you know, this talk was like an imaginary thing and it was, seemed way off in the future. And so I was sort of, I would be reading a novel and I would hit some beautiful imagery and I would just sort of set it aside, like put it in a file. Like maybe we'll come back to that. Like maybe that'll be something we can refer to. I'd read something that another writer said about imagery and I would sort of put that in the file. Maybe I can use that in this future talk, this future essay. And then I finally sat down to write the thing and it didn't take three or four pages to realize that a great deal of what I have to say on the subject of imagery is profoundly dry. Um, I mean, profoundly dry. Like I was like three pages and I was like, I would not want to sit through this freaking talk. Um, so I panicked for a minute and then I set it aside and I thought, well, maybe uh, I can try to come back at the subject in a way that's not just idea and explanation, but in a way that has a little bit more heart. And so I did, I, took, I tried to take a more personal angle into the subject and it was going better. And it eventually became this thing that I'm about to read to you. But I realized about halfway through this one that I was only sort of still writing about imagery. I was in fact writing about a subject which is, well, it's related at least in the sort of squirrely jumble of my brain, but um, really it's a subject that has more to do with the condition of being human, especially uh, a human who writes. And what I discovered was that I was writing about loneliness. Um, this is gonna be fun. <laughs> this is gonna be fun, isn't it? 
I really wish like y'all decided to take a nap during this, <laughs> during this section. Anyway, anyway. So this is something about imagery and something about loneliness, and here it goes. I have a friend, a poet, about 20 years my senior, who lives all alone in a ramshackle little rental house on a couple of acres of scrub and honeysuckle. This poet and I became acquainted during the semester he served as a visiting writer at the University of Tennessee. I invited him to dinner one night, and we had a good time. And for the rest of the semester, he was more or less a weekend fixture in our house. He liked my wife's cooking, and he liked flirting with her, and for good reason. She's an excellent cook and a charming human, my wife. He liked my two beautiful daughters, how they would emerge from their ablutions to tell him goodnight before we packed them off to bed. He liked that we let him bring his dog to dinner. He liked that there was always plenty of liquor in my house, and that we would stay up late with him on my back patio, talking about books and the problem of being alive. He liked, I think, the fact of us, his perception of us, my ordinary family, and how different our life must have seemed from his own. My poet friend has chosen a lonely life, a life perfectly suited to his work, while I have chosen a life in which loneliness has, to all appearances, been crowded out. Writing is so often described as a lonely profession that describing it that way has become cliche, though its overuse doesn't make it any less the truth. In his Nobel Prize acceptance speech, Hemingway said that writing is at best a lonely life. In the recent film, The End of the Tour, the character of David Foster Wallace weighs in on the subject, taking the idea a step further by bringing readers into the equation. And it turns out, that the actual David Foster Wallace really did say these words. There's a set of magical stuff that fiction can do for us. One of them has to do with the sense of capturing what the world feels like to us in the sort of way that I think a reader can tell another sensibility like mine exists. Something else feels this way to someone else so that the reader feels less lonely. But look carefully at his phrasing. He describes capturing the world as it feels to us, us writers, he means, each alone, an individual in our specific sensibilities, and by so doing, by capturing the world as it feels to each of us writers in a particular moment or in a particular situation, and by putting these feelings on the page, by seeking a lonely reader to share in this experience, aren't we also acknowledging our own loneliness and by this acknowledgement, seeking its end? I swap emails once a month or so with this poet friend of mine, and once every couple of years, I'll drive the hours between us and we'll spend a night or two doing pretty much the same thing we did at my house. We sit on his porch and drink whiskey and talk and look up at the stars. The way our email exchange generally goes is that this poet friend of mine sends me a poem of his or a poem that he likes by some other writer and I send his poems back with a few notes, or I send him a poem that I like by some other writer. Over the years, I have sent him poems by C.D. Wright and Beth Ann Fennelly, Carl Sandburg and Kay Ryan and Cheslov Milos. Those are just the ones I can remember. Sometimes I'll send him a draft of a story of my own to which he almost always uh, replies with something along the lines of, and this is an actual quote from an actual email, he almost always replies with something along the lines of, quit screwing around and get your hands dirty, you little chicken shit. <laughs> this is one of the many things I like about my poet friend. He wants me, and every other fiction writer for that matter, to write more like Tolstoy or Joseph Conrad. I recently sent him a novel I'd just read, a novel I very much admired, a National Book Award winner for the record, and his assessment was as follows. How in the world am I, at 68, a poet, supposed to warm up to the thin and dreadful gruel that I so often find championed anymore? <laughs> a few months ago, I sent him a poem by a recent laureate, and he wrote back, I've about had it with tedious little minimalist poems. <laughs> Literature begins with the vivid image, 
and ends with the vivid image, and everything in between is just talk. Hang on a second. Let me get a sip of water. <clears throat> Sorry, I should have had this open. For all his cantankerousness, my poet friend is not incorrect in his bottom line. Literature begins with the vivid image and ends with the vivid image, and everything in between is just talk. And he's not the only one who thinks so. T.S. Eliot, you guys know this already, T.S. Eliot coined the phrase objective correlative to designate, the way I understand it, what he believed was the most important element in writing, rendering the description of an object or a situation so that the emotional state of the character from whose point of view we receive the description is revealed without ever telling the reader what that emotional state is or what has motivated it. His exact words are these. The only way, the only way of expressing an emotion is by finding an objective correlative, a set of objects, a situation, a chain of events, which shall be the formula of that particular emotion, such that when the ex external facts, which must terminate in a sensory experience are given, the emotion is immediately evoked. Surely John Gardner, recognized in his lifetime as one of the most prominent teachers of fiction writing in the United States, had Eliot in mind when he developed the following exercise for his students. Describe a barn as seen by a man whose son has just been killed in a war. Do not mention the son or war or death. The goal of Gardner's exercise and the implication of Eliot's phrase is to steer the writer away from what the poet Denise Libertov called frontal attacks on feeling, away from explanatory language and toward a richer and more complex sense of experience, away from the abstract and toward the concrete, toward imagery. We cannot, in other words, and this is probably obvious, just tell the reader how the father feels after he's lost his son. We cannot simply say that he is sad or broken or devastated or angry or more likely some ineffable combination of the above. We must describe the barn through his eyes in such a way that the reader can live inside the way he feels. No matter how wise a human being you might be, no matter how fine a stylist, language alone will inevitably fall short of experience. We understand the word sadness, but we do not feel sad when we hear it. Both Eliot and Gardner, one a poet, the other a novelist, are asking us essentially to show, don't tell. Hardly a new idea. Literature begins with a vivid image and ends with a vivid image, and everything in between is just talk. <coughs> Excuse me. Not too long ago, I was stuck on the ending of a troublesome story, flailing uselessly on the page and beginning to feel a little desperate about it. And as I often do in moments like that, do you guys do this? I was sort of pacing around in front of my bookshelves, plucking random titles off the shelf and leafing through the pages, hoping to land on a passage that might, like, the, like a gift from the universe, somehow solve my problem, or at least inspire me to sit down and get back to writing. On this particular morning, I happened to pluck Lewis Norton's memoir, Boy with a Loaded Gun, from my shelf. In its opening pages, Norton writes, during the day while my mother worked, I moved with ease across the small property where we lived. Mr. Alexander next door stopped by with a honeycomb from his hive, which he shared with me. The crunching in my ears as I chewed the comb were only bee carcasses, he told me, some of the best eating. An old lady down the street yelled at me not to throw persimmons onto her sidewalk. In a corner of the yard stood what we called the arbor, really a large wooden frame draped with fragrant grapevines, muscadines, which attracted an enormity of tuneful bumblebees into the foliage. Beneath the shade of those vines, I stood with my eyes closed and breathed deep and drank in the purple fragrance of the swollen grapes and of the sweet leaves that after a summer rain smelled like green peas. The bees were as loud as a stringed orchestra. <clears throat> and when I grew up and read a poem by Yeats about a bee loud glade, I was certain I had heard what the poet heard and heard it again simply by remembering. On the other side of the house, stood great dark pecan trees, their shades so deep and constant no matter the weather, the side yard never fully warmed up during the day. And though I played there from morning until supper time beneath those trees, as the sun passed across the blue sky above me, 
The light that reached me was forever dim as twilight. Now, half a century later, the images beneath those magical trees glimmer and ripple and change as if viewed through water, as it seems to me they did even then. All such images, he writes, though they occur to me only as beauty, are really images of loneliness. When I read that passage, I'm struck first by the simple loveliness of the place Norton is describing and the ease with which he moves among his neighbors. Even the grouchy persimmon lady seems pleasant enough through the haze of his nostalgia. And of course, the fragrant muscadines and the tuneful bees, images which, if not exactly mirrored in our own childhoods, certainly call to mind similar images, similar summer days. We're transported into his experience, bringing our experience along for the ride, compounding and complicating this passage from Norton's memoir, all of this conjured up by the imagery in his first few lines and carrying through to his memory of reading the Yeats poem. What you don't see coming is his pivot into loneliness. Though loneliness too is present in that sequence of images, the light under those trees forever dim as twilight, suggesting a deeper awareness of feeling in both Lewis Norton, the child, and Lewis Norton, the grown-up writer of the words that I just read. This book arrived unexpected in my mailbox some years ago, sent to me by a professional friend of mine. In fact, she was here the other day. Kathy Porres is who sent me this book. Um, and I remember so clearly opening her package by the mailbox and reading the first paragraph and stopping cold on the line. Good God, this is like my, my thing come true. My nightmare come true. I turn the page and it's not on the right page. There we go. <laughs> There it is. All right, there it is. Good. Stopping cold on the line. All such images, though they occur to me only as beauty, are really images of loneliness. I wasn't yet aware of the specific context of those words. I didn't yet know that his father was dead or that his mother was often absent on those summer afternoons. I only thought that those words seemed to me as true as any I had ever read, and their truth holds up for me now out of context or within it. All such images, though they occur to me only as beauty, are really images of loneliness. I worry that a talk about loneliness might get depressing in a hurry, and I don't mean for that to be the case. We are here, and we are together, and that's a cause for celebration, and there is nothing depressing about the state of writing in this room. I'm also worried that this talk will only reveal anything about me as a writer and a reader and that will be a shame. That possibility, however, and the gorgeous, lonely truth in Norton's words seem to me located squarely at the troubled heart of the whole business of writing, regardless of your genre. We want to bring our readers news from the world, but we have only ourselves to access it, to make it real. No matter how far we fling our imaginations, we are forever filtering images, starry nights and summer groves, through the scrim of individual experience. We are, if we're writing honestly, and whether we realize it or not, granting the reader access to the most secret parts of our consciousness, precisely those private interior chambers where loneliness resides, and no one but ourselves may venture. That too might sound a little depressing, but I don't think it should. In a 2013 NPR interview, Irish novelist and short story writer Edna O'Brien said, I think that by nature I am lonely, in that I would not be a writer if I were not lonely. I think most writers are. Certain people, I think, this is still Edna O'Brien, certain people, I think, are kind of born lonely. I can tell lonely people when I see them, and I'm very often drawn to them because I feel that they might have some secret to tell me. At first glance, those lines evoke something akin to Hemingway's idea of writing as a lonely life, standard images of a member of our tribe toiling away in solitude. But if we look deeper, we find, I think, something more interesting and perhaps more relevant to the subject at hand, something that distinguishes loneliness from solitude. First, I would not be a writer, she tells us, if I were not lonely, suggesting that the condition of loneliness preceded the condition of being a writer. And second, I'm very often drawn to lonely people because I feel that they might have some secret to tell me, suggesting that loneliness 
might lend itself to a kind of understanding, the possession of a secret. And the question for us becomes what is the nature of that secret and how is it related to loneliness and what does anything, uh, what does any of this have to do with imagery or writing at all? My first year in graduate school was a particularly lonely time for me. I was living alone for the first time in my life. No parents or siblings always in my periphery, no roommates to clutter up my days. I was also feeling very separate from my new peers. <clears throat> not only did I listen to the wrong music, not only did my collared shirts and khaki pants not fit in with their piercings and tattoos, picture a reconstructed frat boy at swim in a sea of pre-hipster artists and intellectuals. Not only had I read all the wrong books and somehow missed postmodernism altogether, <clears throat> not only had I done nothing, literally nothing, in my life except chase girls and go to school, but I was also daunted by the very real talent of those peers. I was beginning to fear that even the best of my fiction was a thinly veiled imitation of other better writers, writers who had lived more exciting, more terrible, more story-worthy lives than mine. I couldn't possibly have anything to write that might be meaningful to anybody else. I had a teacher that year who gave us what I believed then was at best a curious project and at worst a waste of time. In addition to generating new creative work, each student was assigned a different book on craft to read and then report on to the workshop. We had no choice about the books. The teacher brought a bunch of tattered paperbacks to class in a tote bag one day and passed them out and sent us on our way. By pure chance, I was assigned a book called Becoming a Writer by Dorothea Brand. Has anybody ever read that book? So, I mean, you're the only, I mean, read this book. All right. <clears throat> and for a good long while, I resisted the lessons Mrs. Ms. Brand was trying to teach me. There was nothing in these pages as straightforward and practical as go easy on the adverbs, young man. <laughs> Instead, there were section headings like cultivating an artistic temperament and the transparent barrier and the arrogant intellect and inducing an artistic coma. <laughs> Her book read to me uh, more like some kind of oddball philosophy, and the only practical advice that I could find, at least at first, had to do with what sounded an awful lot like meditation practices and nothing at all like sensible advice for making my stories better. So I resisted her wisdom stubbornly and stupidly and naively until well past the halfway point I came across these words. It is well to understand as early as possible in one's writing life that there is just one contribution that each of us can make. We can give into the common pool of experience some comprehension of the world as it looks to each of us. There is just one sense in which everyone is unique. No one else was born of just your parents at just that time in just that country's history no one underwent just your experiences, reached just your conclusions, or faces the world with the exact set of ideas that you must have. If you can come to such friendly terms with yourself that you are able to tell a story as it can appear only to you of all people on earth, you will inevitably have a piece of work which is original. I found those words uh, profoundly heartening. They arrived at a moment in my writing life when I needed to be convinced that not only was my experience a worthy subject for good writing, but the only vantage point from which I could look honestly at the world. She didn't mean, the way I understood it, that I was restricted to writing about boys who'd grown up in Mobile, Alabama, or graduate students stranded unhappily in an unfamiliar place. I could write about aliens, or cowboys, or telepathic monkeys if I wanted to, so long as I brought my deepest and truest self to bear on those aliens and cowboys and telepathic monkeys. It is worth noting that even in the quote that I just read, Brand recognizes the importance of the individual, of isolation, little old me out of all the people on earth. A daunting notion in many ways, but far from a depressing one. All of Dorothea Brand's oddball philosophy and meditation exercises were really trying to teach me how to gain access to that lonely part of myself in writing. At this point, you're probably beginning to wonder if I've forgotten about imagery altogether. 
And you might be asking what happened to your grouchy old poet friend. And it's likely that many of you are feeling much as I did the first time I read Dorothea Brand. You might be wondering, as I did then, what the hell is this fool talking about and why am I still here listening? Well, you're nice people and it would be rude <laughs> for you to get up and walk out uh, here at this point in my talk. I hope, however, that we are gradually creeping up on an answer to the questions suggested by Edna O'Brien. The only secret we have to give is ourselves, and the only method we have for giving ourselves is imagery. <clears throat> Ezra Pound tells us, it is better to present one image in a lifetime than to produce voluminous works. I don't think he means those words literally. The one image he's referring to is a kind of truth, the concrete revealing the interior, the abstract, the expression of our experience, a way to let the reader in, and isn't bridging the gap between reader and writer the greatest challenge for any writer in any genre? Notice the word choices in Dorothea Brand. The world as it looks to each of us, she writes, and a story as it can appear only to you. She's not asking us to explain what we think or how we feel, but to render what we see. I did once send my poet friend a poem he liked. Maybe you know this poem. It's by a writer named Jack Gilbert, and it's called A Brief for the Defense. I'm just going to read it. Sorrow everywhere. Slaughter everywhere. If babies are not starving someplace, they are starving someplace else with flies in their nostrils. But we enjoy our lives because that's what God wants. Otherwise, the mornings before summer dawn would not be made so fine. The Bengal tiger would not be fashioned so miraculously well. The poor women at the fountain are laughing together between the suffering they have known and the awfulness in their future, smiling and laughing while somebody in the village is very sick. There is laughter every day in the terrible streets of Calcutta and the women laugh in the cages of Bombay. If we deny our happiness, resist our satisfaction, we lessen the importance of their deprivation. We must risk delight. We can do without pleasure, but not delight, not enjoyment. We, have the stubborn, we must have the stubbornness to accept our gladness in the ruthless furnace of this world. To make injustice, the only measure of our attention is to praise the devil. If the locomotive of the Lord runs us down, we should give thanks that the end had magnitude. We must admit that there will be music despite everything. We stand again at the prow of a small ship, anchored late at night in the tiny port, looking over to the sleeping island. The waterfront is three shuttered cafes and one naked light burning. To hear the faint sound of oars in the silence as a rowboat comes slowly out and then goes slowly back is truly worth all the years of sorrow that are to come. My poet friend admires this poem because it is most certainly not tedious or minimalist or little, because it is the very opposite of those things, willing to look at the ruthless furnace of the world without flinching, willing to call out both the devil and the Lord. And he's absolutely right. But if I'm being honest, it's not the first part of the poem that stays with me, but it's closing images, lonely images, if you ask me. That sleeping village and those shuttered cafes, that naked light burning and the sound of those oars in the silence of the night. Curious, isn't it, that of all the images Gilbert might have conjured to embody gladness and delight, of all the images in the world worth the years of sorrow that are to come, he lands on an image of solitary pleasure, of loneliness, for lack of a better word, made profound because the rest of us are present right there in the syntax to share that beautiful loneliness with him. And at the same time, granting both the speaker and the reader relief from it. That's what all good writing seeks to do, if you ask me. That's definitely why I read. 
And it's certainly what David Foster Wallace was describing way back at the beginning of this talk. This may sound hopelessly obvious, but we can't feel less lonely, to use Wallace's words, unless we are lonely. It is possible that I am asserting that all good writing is about loneliness, though I'm not quite ready to admit that. And even taking that assertion for granted, we might find countless ways to examine the subject, be it heartbreak or loss or the grave injustices of fate or a young boy drifting through the shadowy places in his yard. By my reckoning only and boiled down to its essence, all great literature expresses a desire for human connection. And that desire can't exist without its opposite, without loneliness of one kind or another. Think of Emma Bovary burning her wedding bouquet and Anna Karenina on all those trains. <clears throat> Think of Mrs. Dalloway hunting flowers for her party. Think of Holden Caulfield in Central Park. Think of Shia Denver in Beloved. <clears throat> Excuse me. Think of that myopic grandmother en route to meet her killer and a good man is hard to find. Think of Gatsby and Daisy and poor Nick Carraway, our proxy, standing off to one side, bearing witness to the death of love. There's a moment early in The Great Gatsby that might have some bearing on this thing that I am trying and failing to make sense of, this connection between imagery and loneliness, writer and reader. It's in chapter three, the night Nick, our narrator, attends his first of Gatsby's famous parties. He's only just met his host on the previous page and he's been feeling out of place at the party. He's been abandoned for a time by Jordan Baker, if you haven't read the book, The Woman He Arrives With. And he looks up, and there's Gatsby. And I'm quoting now. There's Gatsby, alone on the marble steps, and looking from one group to the next with approving eyes. His tanned skin was drawn attractively tight over his face, and his short hair looked as though it were trimmed every day. I could see nothing sinister about him. I wondered if the fact that he was not drinking helped set him off from his guests, for it seemed to me that he grew more uh, correct as the fraternal hilarity increased. Girls were putting their heads uh, on men's shoulders in a puppyish, convivial way, and girls were swooning backwards playfully into men's arms, even into groups, knowing that someone would arrest their fall. But no one swooned backward onto Gatsby, and no French bob touched Gatsby's shoulder, and no singing, quartet, uh, no singing quartets were formed with Gatsby's head for one link. A lonely image, if there ever was one, but in the middle of all that hilarity, all that elegant racket, out of all those hundreds of people at the party, it's Nick who recognizes Gatsby's loneliness and sympathizes with it precisely because he knows loneliness himself. Fiction writers especially, but poets too, sometimes describe the experience of inhabiting their characters or hearing their characters speak as if they are possessed by some entity beyond themselves but I never quite believe them, not because I'm unfamiliar with the phenomenon, but because I've come to believe that what's, what's happening in those instances is not channeling another person's experience or magically patching into someone else's way of looking at the world, not the outside reaching in, but the inside reaching out, the writer locating in her character some essence of herself. The character is merely the vehicle for bringing that essence to life. Ask me two weeks from now if I still feel the same way, and it's possible that I'll give you a different answer, but, but I'm beginning to think that the nature of that essence might be a kind of loneliness. Let me give you just one more example, a little more subtle than the last. This one is from ZZ Packer's classic story, Brownies. Do you guys know this story? Great story. <clears throat> and just in case you're not familiar with this story, it's about a troop of young African-American brownie scouts at summer camp who decide to confront the girls in an all-white troop because they may or may not have used the N-word. In this excerpt, our brownies have snuck away for a clandestine meeting in the camp restroom to plan their revenge. Near the end of their meeting, we read the following. Daphne walked to the counter, took a clean paper towel, and carefully unfolded it like a map. With it, she began to pick up trash all around. Daphne, Arnetta asked, are you coming? We all looked back at the bending girl, the thin of her back, hunched like the back of a custodian sweeping the stage, caught in limelight. Stray strands of her hair were lit near transparent, thin fiber optic threads. She did not nod yes to the question, nor did she shake her head no. She abided, bent. 
Then she began again, picking up leaves, wads of paper, the cotton fluff innards from the torn stuffed toy. She did it so methodically, so exquisitely, so humbly, she must have been trained. I thought of those dresses she wore, faded and old, yet pressed and clean. I could imagine her mother cleaning other people's houses, returning home, weary. I guess she's not coming, Arnetta said. Earlier in the story, the speaker, Laurel, tells the reader of her hope that she and the object of her description, Daphne, might become friends. But she soon, quote, understood that two people like us, two quiet people like us, were better off alone. And while the image of Daphne cleaning this camp restroom, uh, while everyone looks on as lonely, yes, spotlighting Daphne's isolation from the others, it's also beautiful through Laurel's eyes. One profound loneliness, recognizing and empathizing with another. Both characters are further separated from their fellow brownies by an awareness that the circumstances surrounding the pending confrontation are more complicated than they might appear. Unlike their peers, they understand that there is, quote, something dark in the world that they cannot stop. They possess a secret, in other words, just as Edna O'Brien suggested. The last time I visited my poet friend, it was warm enough for us to sit out on his porch, and I asked him what he did with his days. My question, I thought at the time, was simply curious. My own days are so often consumed with teaching and parenting that the idea of living in near-perfect solitude has become a mystery to me. I wanted, quite literally, to know how he passed his time. His answer went something like this. Well, I wake up and I make a pot of coffee and I let my dog outside and then I just sort of wait until I notice something and my day begins. Those might not be his exact words, but they're close. And the phrase, notice something, is definitely his. And though I wasn't aware of it in the moment, I'm certain that there was an element of concern or even pity in my question. Surely my poet friend was lonely. Certainly my ordinary hectic life, brimming with parent-teacher conferences to attend and lawns to be mowed and dishes to be washed and student manuscripts to mark up and professional obligations to meet, surely such a life insulated me from loneliness and wasn't that a good thing? But his answer, filled me up with envy. There was, of course, a practical element to this envy. My poet friend's isolation gave him a whole lot more time for noticing, which is the very thing that Lewis Norden is doing when he describes his childhood summer days and that Dorothea Brand is asking us to do every time we sit down to write. But I also, in a way that caught me off guard, envied his proximity to loneliness. How weird does that make me sound? On a scale of one to 10, I'm pretty sure my children and my wife would put that statement somewhere around an eight. Slightly weirder than a collector of porcelain clown figurines, but slightly less weird than a 9-11 truther. But I wonder if part of our job is to seek out that proximity to loneliness, or maybe it's always so close that we just lose sight of it sometimes. Last March, thanks to a series of fortuitous coincidences, my wife and my daughters and I wound up at the beach for spring break. For the first time in 10 years, my break from UT happened to overlap with my daughter's break from school, and my wife had some work in Charleston that same week, and we decided to rent a condo and try to pass the whole trip off as a tax dodge. <laughs> Rich people do it all the time, we thought, and just this once, why shouldn't we? Maybe I could even write a little bit while we were there as a kind of backup cover story for the IRS. <laughs> now I've done it. Like now that line is in this talk. And I have, if they had come to me, like I'm covered. Um, thank you very much. And my family would adjourn to the beach for a couple of hours each morning while I did just that. And on one of these mornings, I was sitting on the balcony of our condo with my laptop. <clears throat> And I looked up from my writing, and what I saw was this. My youngest daughter, my 13-year-old, hunting shark's teeth on her hands and knees at the water's edge, that damp border the waves dribbled over and drizzled over in their last gasp and left behind on their retreat. And my 16-year-old, 
closer to my vantage point, perched in a beach chair on the softer sand, reading Pride and Prejudice with Zombies, and wearing her bikini just in case a handsome boy happened by. <clears throat> and my wife, too, maybe 50 yards away, returning from one of her long walks, her shirt tail snapping, the wind crazy in her hair. This scene before my eyes struck me with great force. The empty beach and the wind and the end of winter sea backdropping these three women that I love, each engaged in her private pursuits, each tucked into the bubble of her life. My immediate instinct was to ditch my laptop and go dashing down the stairs and out onto the sand and make everybody fly a kite together or something. But of course that would have ruined everything. All I would have achieved with my kite or my frisbee or my stupid beach ball was to render the scene more ordinary, even false. <laughs> my appearance on that beach would have instantly stripped the moment of what made it sublime. And so, for lack of a better conclusion this, to this talk, I offer that morning up to you, because literature begins with the vivid image and ends with the vivid image, and everything in between is just talk. And because all such images, though they occur to me only as beauty, are really images of loneliness. I'm literally like four words from the end of this thing. <laughs> <laughs> and I thank you for sharing mine. <laughs>